Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from three passages. The first one being Micah 6, 8. The second, Matthew 28, 19. And the last, Revelation 7, 8. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The second reading is from Matthew 28, verse 19. Verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The last passage is Revelation 7, 8. Just give me one second. Verse 8. Sorry, is it verse 9 instead? Yes, it's verse 9. Sorry, verse 9. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. This is the word of the Lord. Now I call upon Brother Raymond to bring us God's message for today. Good morning. Uh, Greetings in the name of the Lord for both on-site and uh, online participants. Uh, It's been a while since I've been up here. So, uh, just to make sure, I'm actually Raymond. So, uh, just to make sure that it's correct, I can, I can identify Charles, yeah. <laughs> Matthew. So, so I'm, I'm legitimate. Yeah, today, uh, I'd like to share on the topic of God's plan and purpose for indigenous people of our nation. Actually, it's quite a timely topic, you know, as we approach uh, GE 15. It's timely to bring to top of mind uh, the people of this land, right? After all, we live in this land, and, but there are people of this land who are natives to this land. Uh, to bring to mind the many challenges to their lives and their livelihood of these communities. If those in authority and power have not done the right thing to these people who are truly the native sons and daughters of the land, we all need to be aware of the obstacles and the needs of these communities and what is required to radically change the trajectory um, of the the lives of these people who are often excluded, often in poverty and sometimes in despair. So let us pray. Lord our Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us here to worship, to pray and now to hear your words. Lord, may you grant each one of us the uh, inspiration of the, your word to see the light from what your word revealed to us and also to experience the prompting of the spirit in our heart to understand your word and, the, and its implication for our response to this special community of yours the indigenous community of this nation so Lord uh, grant us um, your understanding and your wisdom as we discuss these topics in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us uh, start with the vision, I mean the verse that was uh, in verse 9, uh, which was read just now, verse 9 and 10. What, what is God's ultimate vision for his kingdom community? His kingdom community is a community of all people. I shall read the verse 9 again. Um, it says, After this I looked, and there before me a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, 
and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So this is actually John the Apostle's vision of the new heaven and earth. And this vision actually is a full reversal of the image of the Tower of Babel. Remember in Tower of Babel, everyone had one common language, but they all rebel against God. Remember the Tower of Babel story. But this vision is completely different, a complete reversal of the Tower of Babel. In, in the new heaven and new earth, all the diverse people groups are before God, worshipping Him in one accord. SMC is quite blessed uh, with a diversity of people, right? We have people from uh, different countries, different parts. And, but our diversity is nowhere near the diversity of this vision. And this vision of diversity is, is all nations, all tribes, all peoples, all tongues. So this vision of what is to come is much more exciting than what we have today. You know, our, you know we are very blessed to have a congregation coming from different backgrounds and so on. But in that final, uh, in the new earth and heaven, we see a greater vision of everyone blessing uh, the Lamb of God. And what do they have in common? Uh, remember in Tower of Babel, they have one common language, but yet they rebel against God. But now what they have in common is even more important. We read they were wearing white robes, signifying purity. And they were holding palm branches, which signifies victory. And this is the victory over sin and death um, that was brought through the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And if you look at further down in, the, uh, in this same passage, uh, you know what John further says to, about all these people? Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So with this vision in mind, uh, let us turn our attention to the present day reality of the indigenous people who live in this world and this land. This is a very busy chart, but I just want to emphasize two things. You know, since uh, 2007, the United Nations have a declaration of the rights of the indigenous people. There's a they put into a declaration of rights for these people and Malaysia is a signatory to this uh, declaration of rights where there is obligations to protect the uh, minimum standard of the dignity, well-being and the rights of indigenous people across the world. And where are we today? I think this is a few, a few years old but um, just to emphasize a few points. Number one is that fewer there are fewer than 5% of the world's population are indigenous people, considered indigenous people. About just under 400 million out of the 7 plus billion people. But of these 15% of the world's poor come from indigenous people. So a large proportion of the poor of the world, more than 15%, are indigenous people. And the second observation is that, which is very important for, you know, our climate and sustainability of this world is that these people occupy 22% of the land that is habitable in this on, on earth. But however, they are actually custodians of 80% of this planet's biodiversity. So the land that they occupy accounts for 80% of the biodiversity of this earth. So they play a very important role, you know, where they live, the land that they own. So the UN's definition of indigenous people are basically those with distinct social and cultural groups that, sh that have collective um, ancestral ties to the land and natural resources of the land, where they live, occupy, and very often they've been displaced from this, uh, um, the places of... Uh, where they live for, for many generations. 
So back to Malaysia, uh, some, uh, this again, uh, quite a lot of words there, but let me summarize a few points about where, where we are with indigenous community. So the first point is that this is from the 2020 census and the, uh, the 2017 uh, state census. A few observations. In Peninsular Malaysia, where we are, but the Orang Asli are just a very small minority. Uh, there are about 18 Orang Asli uh, subgroups uh, in Peninsula. There's only about 0.654% of the people in Peninsula are the Orang Asli, about 200,000. So there are about 18 tribes located in various parts of Malaysia, largely in the, on, along the main range, the main range of the peninsula. But however, the statistic is very different in Sabah and Sarawak. In Sabah and Sarawak, the indigenous people are the majority of the people uh, in, in both Sabah and Sarawak. In the case of Sabah, about 50 plus percent. In the case of Sarawak, uh, about 70 percent, even higher of the population, you know, coming from many tribes. In Sabah, there are about 30, 39 different subgroups. In Sarawak, about 15 distinct subgroups. Why am I sharing these statistics? It's very important to note that, note, note this fact that it's very important for us to, to have a strategic response to helping these people. You see, in Malaysia, in a Christian context, in Malaysia, uh, we have about 9.5% of the populations are Christians, and there's about 3 million in, in the whole of Malaysia. Of this, of this 3 million, more than 75% are from Sabah and Sarawak. And the majority of these, majority of these people, 70%, come from the indigenous community. So God's plan and purpose for indigenous people of Malaysia is very, very critical and strategic for us to support and to strengthen them. So it's, it's very important to strengthen the indigenous churches as a, as a mission field for us, uh, for, for their, for their well-being as well, for nation building. It's a top priority calling for us. Because the, remember, the majority of these people in Sabah, Sarawak, there are majority races, uh, indigenous people there, and of them, majority of them are Christians as well. But of course, over time, you know, that has been eroded through various, you know, policies and various, uh, you know, exclusion of them from from the mainstream uh, of our, you know, very much race-based. Polit political environment. So one more point to share on what are the present realities that these indigenous people in Malaysia face? I mean, there are three common, talking to them, there are three common indignities that these people suffer. Firstly, injustice. Secondly, exploitation. And denigration. You know what's injustice, right? You know, their rights are taken away. Um, they don't have people to advocate for them. Inequality, they are the poorest of the poor in, the, in this country. Denigration is actually a word that I use because it's about denying the importance and the validity of these people in this land. Imagine they are the natives of this land, but very often in social, political, and economic discussion, these people are nowhere to be seen, you know, nowhere to be represented. Uh, by the, the main parties, the main races of this country. So it's important to reverse this, you know. And, and there are ma many people advocating this. Uh, in a recent publication uh, just published in September this year, an anthology of uh, indigenous people's issues. These are summary of all the main issues that they face. The first two is very important. Poverty, inequality, and lack of basic rights. Uh, there's nobody advocating their basic rights and protecting their basic rights. And the other thing is very important to, 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 to exploitation and commercialization and so on and urbanization. Their customary land uh, is 
continuing to be decreased, you know, be, you know, been taken over by, you know, government and companies. And then that independence as an economic community is also severely affected because their land, their resources have been, you know, either exploited or taken away from them. So that first two account for all the other issues, you know, hunger, malnutrition, access to good education. Uh, sometimes they're even invisible to, you know, their identity is also, they don't even carry identity cards. <laughs> so they're totally excluded from the e economic and even government aid as well. And as, as we all know, access to health, access to basic infrastructure, water, electricity, um, you know, they don't get access to that easily. So all these are the present realities that this community face. And if you want to read a good account of it, look at this uh, book on the anthology of uh, indigenous people issues, a well documented all these issues. So with this background in mind, what should, how should we then respond? The Word of God has, um, I pick up two passages for us to focus on. One is a very familiar passage, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, O mortal, o mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So what God is telling us is that we are, we are, we have to do exactly the opposite of what they have been subjected to. The indigenous people. Remember, I said they have been in, subjected to injustice, exploitation, denigration. So, what the word of God says to us is that you know, we have to do exactly the opposite of what's been done to them, which is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with, with, in relation to indigenous people. Remember, Micah was prophesying during the same period as Isaiah, uh, Hosea, Amos. Some of us studied Amos in, uh, in our cell group. It was a time when, uh, when the prophets had to warn the people of Israel and Judah about the coming judgment of God for their sin. And what were their sins? And most of these sins were committed by the leaders themselves, not just the people. And the sin was basically they ignored God's call for justice, you know, you see that in Micah chapter 3, um, verse 1. And then the prophets, some of the prophets um, were also leading the people astray by being motivated by self-interest. Instead of looking at the interest of the people, they were looking at self-interest. And number three, the, uh, the rulers and the officers were corrupt, motivated by money and so on. So this words came in the midst of those warnings. So the positive thing for them to be, to avoid God's judgment was to do exactly what God says here. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. But it's not just social actions that God called us to do. There's also another important Remember the vision that I shared just now in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9? Eventually, God wants all these people to be, to be in the community where they worship God as one people. And therefore, the, the spiritual aspect is just as important. And the passage in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, the mandate that to go and make disciples of all people not just our kind, but all people, and especially the people who are most vulnerable. And we have a great opportunity in Malaysia where already many of them have been reached out by missionaries and, uh, and churches there. But there's more work to be done to uh, you know, arrest the uh, exploitation and the, and, and the difficulties that these people are, been, are faced with. So we are not only called to do good in social action in isolation. The work of sharing the good news of Jesus 
and spiritual discipleship of this community is of importance as we journey with them. So, so that eventually they and ourselves can all be in the same place like in, in the vision of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. So we are... SMC has supported uh, indigenous ministries through you know, our support of Malaysian Care. Malaysian Care has one of our partner organization has special focus also on indigenous ministries. And last week, I think there was a good sharing among the support for the Penan, uh, Penan pastor and the family. And I know there are individual things that, you know, like Hannah and Daniel has done with Lakao in, one, in small ways to help these communities. So the more awareness we have, the better that we can help this community. And therefore, I'd like to share some perspective of the uh, work of the NEC, which is a broader platform in, to unite the churches and the NGOs to work together, uh, to bring the resources together to help this community be self-sustaining, uh, be spiritually empowered. So how many of you have heard of NEC? Some of you have heard of some, not. So NEC started several, several years ago, and the, it was initiated uh, by our Bishop, Bishop Emeritus Hua Yong and a group of uh, Christian leaders to want to sp place special emphasis of the church collaboration with NGOs to focus on various ministries to these people so that, lot, so that they can be self-sufficient, self-sustaining, and their churches are strengthened. Because in a lot of situations, the congregation can't even, have to, can't even afford to pay for the living expenses of the pastor in many cases, let alone support themselves. So because of that, we need to strengthen uh, this, this, these communities. And in summary, there are three, as, there are four areas, apart from the spiritual empowerment, which I mentioned was very important. They look at the community empowerment, economic empowerment, and next generation. So gathering all these NGOs and church, church across denominations to work together to share resources to help this community be self-sufficient. And we are very encouraged. I think there are examples, for example, um, you know, we visited uh, Bishop James Wong of the, or the Basel uh, Christian Church. So he's gathering all the churches in, uh, in Sabah to work together in community project to make the churches self-sufficient in their spiritual development, in their economic development, and, and support of the, the, the poor and the community there. And the other example uh, recently I heard too was, you know, Pastor Sanusi, uh, the marriage church in Mantin. He is very passionate, he's very passionate to make sure that he's, each member of his congregation is self-sustaining in terms of employment, in terms of, in terms of um, work, in terms of making sure that the land produces food and crops to support the family as well as support the community. And he doesn't want handouts. He wants the community to work with him as a pastor, a leader, uh, for them to be strengthened spiritually, for them to be economically independent, and so that to the extent that they can even support other churches and other pastors and other communities. So that's the vision we want to support. Not just give handouts, but work alongside them to really empower them so that they can be independent and they can be um, you know, self-sustaining as well. So I'd like to share some examples of the work that's done by NEC, just to give you a snapshot of um, the areas of work they get involved in. And maybe some, some of you may be called to work in the NGOs and the community. Uh, in, in both Sabah, Sarawak and Peninsula. One area in the area of economic empowerment, for example, is the collaboration in Sabah with the um, K 
Kivatu Nature Farm. These are a community of farmers, about 50, 50 farmers. And PACOS. PACOS is an organization of indigenous, indigenous communities based in uh, Koto Kinabalu. And they got together basically amongst themselves. They organized uh, the ability to you know, help with the farmers with the uh, planting of the, uh, the organic crops and then helping them to distribute and sell them in the markets and also online through, through people ordering it online. And this all happened during the, uh, during the pandemic, the last two, three years, all these initiatives. So they're starting there and maybe expanding beyond there. So that's one example of the community themselves wanting to be independent uh, financially and economically so that they can help the churches there. Another example is in, uh, in this is in Kuching, we, we call it the farm, farm Direct Shop. And basically, this is Pastor uh, Jeff, Jeff Way and Alan Way, his, uh, his counterpart. And basically, they go around, uh, around Kuching to um, source for you know, organic, small organic farmers, the indigenous people, sourcing, developing, processing, and distributing their uh, their produce um, and also to build entrepreneurship with these people so that they, they are able to sustain their, their community. And the model is very interesting because typically if you are a, a big supermarket or a big commercial enterprise will go to the farmers and for let's say a dollar, a dollar of produce they only give the, um, the small farmers 20 cents. They keep the 80 cents for their logistic and their profit margin and so on. So this farm direct shop is the other way around. 80%, let's say the retail price is $10, $8 go to the farmers for their developing, for buying their seeds, de developing the processing facilities. 20% goes to running this shop, including the manpower in this shop. And I think all the manpower in this shop are run by indigenous people. So this is one initiative. Hopefully, they can also replicate to other parts of Sarawak, Sabah, and here as well. So this is a very interesting initiative to, you know, out of focusing on indigenous community to make sure that uh, the middlemen don't take away all, all, all the fruits of their, their work. And, the, and Pastor Jeff, uh, who is also spiritually helping these farmers and their family on the spiritual side, the building their spiritual uh, side as, part, as, as well as empowering them. Another different dimension is uh, the youth. Very often people say the youth are not interested to go back to their land to, uh, to do something because they want to go to the urban. That's not true. There are some of them who want to stay back. So there's this initiative uh, done through Hope Methodist Church in City Awan, Hope Methodist Church and also the Methodist Council of Education. There's a collaboration with NEC and uh, Chris, uh, some of, somebody who's very experienced in uh, organic as well as uh, poultry farming. So they set up a social enterprise for, to support the OA youth in poultry farming from buying the uh, the, the chicks to setting up the, the, uh, all the facilities and also helping them to uh, sell this uh, organic chicken in, in City Awan, Ipoh area and so on. So they just started this project with about 20 people and they hope to run, run this up three or four times a year um, starting from next year to, to increase the, uh, the number of people doing, doing this activity. And they intend to also set up a cooperative to help these uh, people in, in, in poultry farming. And the youth, the youth are involved in this, in this initiative. Lastly, but not lastly, uh, I'm not sure whether any one of you heard of, heard of this initiative on community empowerment. Uh, our partner organization is Safe Rivers and Peter Kalang. Actually, he started uh, Safe Rivers in 2011 when he tried, he together with the community leaders of indigenous people tried to stop 
the construction on the Baram, the Baram River Dam. So after five years of lobbying activities, uh, act, you know, lobbying and advocacy, they managed to, <laughs> surprise, you know, managed to stop the project from happening. That's why they still have Baram River, you know, in its pristine state, uh, although logging is still uh, affecting it. But he was successful in doing that. So we, we, from that initiative, he created this NGO called Safe Rivers with a view of, uh, especially in the Baram area, collaborating with Kerwan. Kerwan is a Penan NGO. Borneo Project is a group of people who got involved to provide them with their facilities and the support to do the mapping, the entire mapping of the, uh, the, the Baram uh, River and Basin area. And if you look at the website, they have done very extensive mapping, you know, using a lot of technology as well as the local knowledge, mapping the land, mapping the use of the land, mapping the fauna and the flora that that is in those land, so that they, so that they can be protected, uh, their land rights and their access to the resources can be protected. And he's very proactive, you know. He started with one man, you know, one person. And now he's, uh, you know, it's a big movement to do that. So initiatives like this, uh, beyond, in addition to what we are doing, uh, are happening. And I pray that this work that the Lord has put in our hearts and in hearts of many church leaders will indeed make a big difference to the indigenous community, Sabah, Sarawak, and in Peninsula because they are the future of the church in you know, Malaysia. 70, 80% of Bahasa speaking people there. And they are, the, they are the, the church of the future for this nation. And we are partners with them to build and strengthen their churches so that they can be self-sustaining and their families and the community can you know, get out of poverty get out from, you know, from the situation they are in so that they can be a blessing to communities outside of their land, outside of their land as well. And Borneo is very strategic because, as you know, Indonesia is also developing Borneo. So the, event, the, uh, the mission field in Borneo is not just Sabah and Sarawak, the whole Kalimantan. Uh, it's a very strategic place, and we are also praying that the church in Indonesia will also collaborate with these uh, indigenous groups in, in Sabah and Sarawak to strengthen the churches, the communities there. And what they are doing is also arresting you know, the situation of climate change and sustainability, not just in this land, but for the surrounding lands. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that, Lord, you help us to reflect on your word from Micah 6, verse 8. Lord, pray that these words from you, Lord, will touch our hearts, will convict our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.